Hi everyone. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more, a couple, a minute or so, just to let everyone connect. Um, yeah, I think everyone's now in. Um, hello, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for attending the launch night of the Balfour's first ever virtual exhibition centered around homeland identity and British colonialism in mandatory Palestine. Um, my name is Rosie. I am a fellow at the Balfour Project and will be hosting the launch night tonight. Um, and I will be introducing our wonderful panels of speakers in a moment, but I just wanted to take a minute to just introduce our project a little bit. Um, so our online exhibition, which I will guide you through at the end of this launch night, comprises of art submitted by Palestinian artists focusing around the theme of mapping. And at the end of this event, I will show you how to virtually walk around the exhibition, click on the art to view it in more detail and purchase it if you desire. Um, we decided, um, we being Francesca and I, um, Francesca is another fellow, and uh, we worked on this project together. Unfortunately, she has COVID at the moment, so she's not going to be speaking, but um, I'm very thankful for all the help that um, she's given me in the, during this project as well. Um, we decided to launch this project because we wanted to raise awareness of the ongoing occupation through a medium that is accessible to all who want to learn, but also one which grants Palestinian artists the creative freedom to express their views about the history historic and ongoing colonialism in the region. We chose the theme of mapping because it has an explicit link to British colonialism and the way in which Palestinian territory has been contested and divided since the Saipico Agreement in 1916, when Britain and France secretly agreed to carve up the Ottoman Empire without the consent of its indigenous peoples, which delineated arbitrary borders with no regard to ethnic and religious groups. Um, maps define and concretize territory and are inherently political and contested. They create worlds and they shape reality and they legitimize and delegitimize populations. And the fact that there is no appearance of Palestine on the hegemonic world map equates to denial of Palestinian existence and results in a lack of awareness around the world of Palestine, its traditions and its history. So we have some wonderful speakers tonight who will be speaking on a range of topics related to art and activism and Palestinian history and culture. And so without further ado, I would like to invite Imad Karem, a filmmaker and trustee at the Balfour Project, to say just a few words about the charity and that this ex exhibition is being organised with. So um, thank you, Imad. Thank you, Rosie. And... Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Balfour Project family. We are really excited to launch this virtual art exhibition uh, exploring the theme of mapping. And as Rosie said, we're doing this in order to raise awareness of the current reality of inequality and injustice in the occupied uh, Palestinian territories. A quick word on the Balfour Project uh, for those who may be new to us. We aim to contribute to peace, justice, and equal rights in both Israel and Palestine. We seek to acknowledge Britain's historical and continuing responsibilities through popular education and advocacy to uphold equal rights for the Israelis and the Palestinians. And we also work towards persuading the British government to recognize the state of Palestine alongside the state of Israel. On recognition, we believe that the British government cannot simply continue to affirm and recognize the rights of Israelis to their state while ignoring the equal rights of the Palestinian people to their state. As you will know, the majority of people in the United Kingdom today are ignorant of Britain's colonial role in Palestine and its impact on the current situation. There is a huge information and education gap, uh, both in terms of the history and the current situation, and how Israelis and Palestinians are vastly unequal in every aspect. Art, and we are talking about art this evening, art has an important role in contributing to the knowledge and untold history of Palestine as well as the historic role Britain played leading up to today. Why art? Because it can convey the situation 
in a way that is both accessible and engaging. Art can reach out to people when they're not expecting it. Unlike perhaps a political rally, a speech, or a conference, it is less in your face and you're not feeling you're being fed a message, or at least a direct message. We might be immunized or have our defenses up or thinking I've heard it all before. But when faced with art, we may be more ready to receive the message and to experience art. In the case of Palestine, art can also help convey the richness of Palestinian culture and heritage, which is often ignored in the mainstream media. Reflecting about this evening, I thought I would share with you a few words by a Russian novelist, philosopher, historian, and political prisoner, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, from his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in 1970, which was delivered on his behalf as he was in prison. He says, art and literature can accomplish a miracle. They can overcome man's most characteristic weakness, the fact that he can only learn by his own experience. Art can amplify each person's short time on earth by enabling him or her to receive the whole range of another person's lifelong experiences with all their burdens, colors, and flavors. Art recreates in the flesh experiences that have been lived by other people and enables people to absorb them as if they were their own. So art can sometimes straighten the dangerous twisted road of a human history. He goes on to say, and the simple step of a simple courageous person is not to take part in the lie, not to support deceit. Let the lie come into the world, even dominate the world, but not through me. And writers and artists are capable of something more they can defeat the lie. Art has always won its fight against lies and it will always win. Everyone can see this, no one can deny it." End of quote. So like me, friends, I hope you're prepared to be challenged, excited, and even inspired tonight. And thank you again for being here. Uh, over back to you, over to you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imad, for those um, inspiring and fascinating words. Um, I would like to invite our first speaker, Noor, who is a student and artist from Nablus, Palestine. She's just finished her bachelor's degree in political science from Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and she's contributed, the art, contributed art to our exhibition today. Um, just a few words before we begin with before I pass over to Noor. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout this, then please put them in the chat and I will ask them at the end. Alternatively, if you have questions at the end, um, feel free to raise your hand and I will ask you to um, ask that to one or any of our speakers. Um, we've chosen to save our questions until the three um, speakers have spoken and then we can open up to a conversation and dialogue with everyone at the end before I then talk you through the exhibition itself. So without further ado, um, Noor, please, over to you. Thank you so much, Rosie, for this. And thank you everybody for being here. It's always so nice to see people interested to learn more about the conflict. Can you hear me, by the way? Okay, perfect. Um, interested to learn more about Palestine and um, the ongoing injustice Palestinians live. Uh, I'm a little nervous. But I always try to uh, start my presentations with saying, um, from Mahmoud Darwish, Ala hadhi al ard haya, there is something worth living for on this earth. Um, because I think a lot of times with the bleakness of the world, we lose hope and we lose uh, our mission, we lose our message in life. And I think that this is something that we should always be reminded of, that we are important and we have a message to contribute to, even if it's as little as submitting uh, an artwork. 
Um, and my uh, my two pieces were about the colonization, the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Um, and I do realize that maps don't necessarily mean much without the stories of the people on the ground. If you look at a map, you only see borders, you only see colors maybe, but without understanding what people are going through um, between these borders and under those regimes, um, they become useless. And I wanna start talking about my maps by reminding us um, of the anniversary, the seventh anniversary of the, of the kidnap and uh, murder of Muhammad Abu Khdair, who was 16 years old when he was um, burned alive by Israeli settlers um, near Jerusalem. Um, three days ago, July 2nd marked his, this, uh, the seven year anniversary. And I think that it's very important to understand that um, why I essentially chose to, to talk about the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Um, I grew up in the West Bank. I grew up in a city called Nablus. Um, I grew up traveling from a city to another and crossing those checkpoints, looking at Israeli soldiers with rifle guns in their hands. Um, and I think that for many Palestinians, the reality is the same. Um, that's not to say that uh, Palestinians living in Gaza, East Jerusalem, 1948 lands, or even in the diaspora, do not experience injustice, but I, uh, they do, and even more so. Um, but since I'm from the West Bank, I decided to shed light ex especially on um, the ongoing Israeli settler colonialism in there. And to talk more and have the opportunity to talk more about um, Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem and uh, the town of Silwan next to Jerusalem um, to talk about how um, people there are forcefully getting evicted, not evicted even, uh, displaced from their homes. Um, but before that, I wanna just give a brief history on uh, Israeli colonialism or the Israeli settlements in the West Bank to be more specific. From 1967 until 2017, more than 200 settlements were established in the West Bank, 132 of which were authorized by the government of Israel. Um, and around 110 to 140, depending on where you get the data from, from Beit Salem or from Peace Now, which are both actually Israeli um, nonprofit organizations who uh, are basically, who advocate for the human rights of the Palestinians Palestinians. Um, so there are 110 to 140 settlements without official authorization, but with the support of the government. Um, and they are called outposts. Um, so we have more than basically 250 settlements in the West Bank right now, uh, more than half a million settlers, around 620,000 uh, Israelis live in settlements in the West Bank. Um, we thought that the agreement in 1993, in the Oslo Accords between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli uh, um, government would actually reduce the number of the settlers. But in fact, they grew exponentially thereafter. From 1993 until, let's say the 2000s, we have, it grew from 116, to 116,000 to, to around 200,000. Um, and, that only speaks to the constant violations um, international uh, against international law that Israel is constantly the, 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 the violating, basically. Um, Israel in the beginning used those settlements for security reasons, right? We hear the word security often when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Um, Israeli, the Israeli government in specific will tell you we are uh, throwing rockets for security reasons. We are uh, arresting people for security reasons. We have the upper tide wall for security reasons. But what we have to understand is, first of all, it's security for who, right? It's security for the most powerful to sustain the status quo, but it's not security for the people on the ground. And something else to be to put in mind, which my political science major is kicking in right now, but um, to put in mind is that security is a very vague words and it's a very broad word it's a very contested term and it depends on the recipient's imagination to decode that word right so security for me is different than security for rosie or adam or matt tan um i'm seeing you on my screen so that's why <laughs> um 
And um, so I think, so when we hear the word security, security forces, um, we have to ask ourselves security for whom and why. Um, and uh, recently we saw the assassination of Nizar bin Nats, for example, from the security forces, the Palestinian security forces, right? But they, security, it's the Palestinian security forces who are killing the Palestinians. So then again, security for who? Um, because the Palestinian Authority is uh, in full cooperation with the Israeli government when it comes to the security cooperation. Um, and it's overlooked actually by the United States and by Britain and France and uh, other Western uh, countries. They overlook the security cooperation to sustain peace, but we haven't experienced peace since the establishment of Israel in 1948. Um, but I, I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk more about uh, Sheikh Jarrah, because I think that um, more uh, like, um, I guess contemporary in politics right now, it's more prevalent uh, when it comes to talking about Palestine. Um, 28 families, around 500 people are facing forced displacement. They are about to lose their homes. Um, and for anybody who understands the word home is where you grew up, it's where the, your heart lies really. And for somebody to just come in and kick you out of your home, uh, for no reason, that's not only illegal, but it's inhumane. Um, we have Israeli settlers living behind the Palestinian homes, in front of Palestinian homes. They are actually emboldened by the Israeli uh, military. Um, and they are emboldened to go after Palestinians, to embarge in their, to like, to barge in the Palestinian homes, um, to to block Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, with big with um, basic, uh, to put it under siege, um, and have it be surrounded by Israeli military, and that's basically what emboldening. That's the role of the police to to um, save to to protect the Israeli settlers. Um, and continue the Israeli colonial project that has that started um, early 1900s. Um, also, I want to talk about Silwan, which is um, a town next to Jerusalem. Uh, around um, 59,000 people live there. Um, there are around 3,000 settlers living in different locations in the town who also constantly uh, make the lives of the Palestinians harder. They make the lives of Palestinians harder when they want to go to work, when they want to sleep, when they want to have only a family gathering. Um, and they are now uh, how they so far the Pal the Israeli government has asked or given. So they give you a paper when they when because they say if it's eviction right, and they give you a paper, and more than around seven thousand people have received that paper that if they don't leave their homes, their homes are going to be demolished. Um, but under what uh, human law, with not even international law, just humanity, like in what humanity can somebody just barge in your home uh, and ask you if, you, if you don't leave right now, uh, we'll demolish your house and we're gonna give you, we're gonna give you time. And that time is considered to be humane in some, in some people's perceptions. Um, I really, really, this is, um, this is it. I wanted to shed more on this stories of the Palestinians when it comes to um, living in the West Bank. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer it after the speakers. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Noor. That was really fascinating. And um, we really appreciate both your insight and also the fact that you've sort of interpreted this project's theme through the lens of the present and whilst acknowledging the history of British colonialism and how much impacts that had that has had on the region you're also acknowledging the present and everything that is happening right now and so I really appreciate you giving us an insight into that from your perspective. Um, I would like to now invite our next speaker, who is um, Professor Yair Wallach, who is a senior lecturer in Israeli studies at SOAS. Um, so please, whenever you're ready, yeah, I will um, take it away. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. 
Um, okay, thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure to to talk in the um, in introducing this exhibition. I'll say so. The people that listen to us haven't seen it yet, so I'll say something about the format, uh, which I thought was really really interesting, and you can see it for yourself uh, later. So this is about framed around mapping, but the exhibition has three kinds of format. It has photographs, which are uh, based on um, early photography of Palestine from the beginning of photography till the British mandate. So that's one room. And then we have uh, 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 one room with both maps uh, which uh, describe the, the maps capture the kind of dynamics that Noah just talked about uh, in the West Bank and, and, uh, and so forth. And then we have one uh, wall, which is uh, paintings and artwork by uh, uh, an artist from Gaza, Malak from Gaza. Uh, so I, um, I thought the combination of paintings and photography and mapping quite interesting. Um, because we are used to think of mapping as a form of some kind of claim to truth. Um, so some kind of scientific representation, some kind of factual statements. And that's kind of the, the part of the rhetorical power of map, and that's why also they become cont contested on that kind of, but we know of course that, that maps are um, a form of visual presentation. And, in, and by combining it with photographs and painting, I think that kind of opens the question of how do we represent a kind of reality and what what is exactly the fact and what exactly the truth and where is the, rhetoric here uh, and uh, and this is puts all these things in conversation as a kind of visual discourse uh, basically and emphasizes that all these things are are uh, not uh, uh, you know these are not just uh, neutral or objective present representations but rather they are embedded and 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 come from specific perspectives. So they can highlight the issue of, of agency of people who produce these things or, re, or reproduce these things and the context in which they, we put them. And I hope this is, uh, um, okay, this might be a bit abstract, but I'll try to kind of unpack this a bit. I think that, um, I mean, I think I thought two, two things that came to mind when I saw these um, is I think one difficulty for um, this uh, kind of work on Palestine is how does it not become propaganda? I think on the one hand you have one you want you have a message you want to convey and a very dire situation. I think we no covered you know what is currently happening, but of course lots of other things are also happening in Gaza and Esp and it has a history. So how to convey the, the, um, the facts, but how not to reduce it to a slogan, how not to reduce it to something that is completely flat, that becomes fetishized or becomes a kind of uh, emptied from its human content. And I think that's a kind of uh, difficulty. How do you represent political issues without just becoming propaganda? Uh, and that's that's a difficult. And I think of Mahmoud Awish or Edward Said as 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 examples of people that kind of wanted to bring the Palestinian story and narrative and perspective and analysis, but did not actually want it to kind of to 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 collapse into slogans and black and white story and, and it wanted to bring the human complexity into it. And I think by combining different kind of genres, I think the exhibition actually does that. Um, and the other difficulty, which is very pronounced mainly in the question of maps and, and, and photographs, 
And the question is, how do you escape the colonial viewpoint? Um, and and that is uh, that is an issue. I think when you um, um, when you deal with the erasure of Palestine and when you deal with denial of Palestine's existence or existence of Palestinians and so forth. So the immediate, um, I think, response is to bring evidence of existence. Um, uh, but when we turn to these evidence, say visual evidence, much of it is was produced in colonial um, setting and by colonial intervention. So that is very, very clear in the case of uh, photography, that the photography arrives in Palestine almost immediately, also, almost within a year that photography is invented as European photographers in Palestine taking pictures. So in that one sense, it's kind of, it's a fantastic material. But they come from a very, very specific viewpoint. I mean, they have this uh, biblical narratives in mind. This is the Holy Land. This is the land of Jesus. It's frozen in time. It's not just an Orientalist depiction that kind of put, put, portrays the, the local people as, as primitive and so forth. It also presents them as kind of frozen two, 2000 years back. Uh, and, uh, and, that, um, and that is very, very clear in early photography of Palestine that people are staged to look like biblical scenes. Now that again fits very neatly later with the Zionist narrative that comes from a different perspective, but also uses the Bible very, very strongly to make a claim uh, that, uh, that the Zionist movement has a superior claim over the, the rights of the local population. Um, so how, how to use this colonial photography without kind of, um, while being aware of the kind of the problematic side of it. I should say that later on we do have Palestinian photographers uh, from the turn of the century and later on. Some of the work they do is quite similar. Some of the work is not. Some of the work you can see a different perspective. Um, there is very much, for example, we can see it in, in the exhibition in the depiction of the general strike um, in Palestine. Suddenly politics enters the frame and then real modern politics. Uh, but against this, we have also older forms of, of photography, which are useful, but the question is how do we employ them? And the same is with, um, with mapping. Mapping arrives in Palestine, modern mapping arrives as a, as a colonial technology. First with the French, uh, French, French campaign against Egypt and the first kind of scientific Mapping of the map of the coast or of the coast of Palestine is by done by a, um, a French cartographer with limited uh, surveying and, and, and mapping uh, in, in in the service of Napoleon's campaign when he goes and occupies Jaffa and then he tries to occupy Akka. Uh, so that's the first attempt. But then later on, we do have Western cartographers arriving. A lot of interest first in Jerusalem late in the survey of Western Palestine in the 1870s, uh, which it has this kind of very interesting combination of military British interests, you know, and the people that do these surveys, I am very much embedded with the British military, including uh, Lord Kitchener, who later uh, uh, rises to be the Secretary of, of War in the First World War. So he's involved in the mapping of Palestine in the 1870s. So there's very clear imperial strategic military interests, but there's also symbolic interests of the British Empire that is interested in Palestine as something that gives meaning to the empire because it's the Holy Land, because it's the land of the Bible. And the survey and the maps that it produces on the one hand, invaluable material, for anyone interested, you know, uh, in the history of modern Palestine, because it gives us a kind of accurate, more a sense of 
how many people live in a village and so forth. But it's very much uh, obsessed with biblical history and crusader history. So not, not Arab history, not recent history, etc. So the question uh, is how do we then, how we, when we are using map and we re and the maps and the exhibitions are, are modern maps, they're not colonial maps, but in how, to what extent the, the, um, the assumptions of mapping work their way into the kind of claims that maps can give, maps reduce, human existence to flat, uh, you know, to geometry and so forth. And, 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 um, and I think, how do we do that um, without losing uh, sight of the kind of, of the ways maps have been employed uh, in the past and continue to be employed today? And I think so that there's a kind of double bind here because again, if you, um, I just, uh, um, rereading um, uh, Shirin Saikali's book, Man of Capital, on the liberal, the liberal bourgeoisie of, of Palestine during the Mandate period. And one of the things they struggled with is the lack of facts, the lack of data, because they, they didn't have state apparatus behind them to allow to create these kind of maps, to allow to create these kind of visualizations and, and collect the statistics and all of these things, they were in at, a, at a disadvantage when they came to claim certain things about, you know, what is the impact of, of Zionism on Palestinians? And they found it difficult because they didn't have the figures. Um, and, Unlike the British, the mandatory state or the Zionist movement who did have access to figures and statistics and the ability to create these statistics. And that kind of, in a way, facilitated part of the political discourse of the 30s and 40s uh, leading to the Nakba. On the other hand, there's a question of how much, how much work facts, facts can do. And I think that the, the, the maps here in the exhibition, they show you the impact and the scale and the scope of the colonization of the West Bank uh, against the kind of the, this, the, you know, there's also other maps. Um, and that occupation, that colonization has been probably one of the most carefully documented by the UN, by Palestinian cartographers, by Israeli NGOs. It didn't seem to, doesn't seem to help. The fact that we know quite a lot doesn't seem to provide us with the ability to stop it. And the question is why? I think why do facts do not, are not sufficient? And I think, I think that and I don't have a very good answer to this, but I think that, but the fact is that they're not sufficient in themselves, unless you can see the humanity behind the figures, um, then the facts in themselves are not gonna be sufficient. And I think what the exhibition does very nicely by combining it with the paintings and the photographs is actually to, to create a, a three-dimensional uh, picture, which is art rather than propaganda, uh, which includes also the ambiguities that any kind of human existence contains. And I think that's why I, I like this combination. So that's what, uh, uh, that's what I had uh, to say here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that sort of fascinating exploration of, of what is truth, what is cartography, what is the relationship between them. Um, that was really um, informative. So thank you so much. I would love to invite our final speaker, Adam, who is a University of Leeds um, Arabic and politics graduate and an advocate for Palestinian rights, as well as a fellow, um, a fellow fellow at the Balfour Project. So thank you so much, Adam. Over to you. Well, thank you so much, Rosie, and uh, I'll just allow me this opportunity to thank everyone who's been involved in this amazing project. 
uh, especially Sissy. I'm really sorry that she's not feeling really well. Um, I saw this project sort of, sorry about that, grow. Um, and uh, I was talking to both Rosie and Sissy from the beginning. And uh, I was excited from the, from the very start. And to see the final product, to see this event come to fruition is a moment of great pride. Uh, so congratulations to both of you. Congratulations to the Balfour Project and everyone who's been involved. That's, it's really gr a great achievement. Um, thank you, Yar, for Professor Yar, for speaking about this, um, because I think that quite often um, we perceive things that are supposedly apolitical as exactly that, as apolitical. We are given maps at, in schools. Um, We're not encouraged to look at them critically. Um, we are given images of places that we have never seen. And yet um, we accept them. We accept them as simple fact and interpretation of the truth. Um, and actually when you start thinking about it and one of the reasons why Palestinians are often or people in general who are indigenous to lands or people who are marginalized from perspectives are often the ones to start ringing the alarm bells when we spot um, our voices being deleted, our existence being denied. Um, and actually when Yar was, Professor Yar was talking about Mahmoud Darwish, in one of his poems, he says, um, um, it, the poem is called, um, it's a, it's a poem, I can't remember the name right now because I just remembered it now. But the poem in one of the, one of the bait, he talks about one of the lines, he says, um, Our life is an obstacle for the night of the historian. Which means every time I try to hide them, they come at me from the darkness or from the non-existence. And I think this is a really powerful thing. And exactly as Professor Yar has said, art um, is giving us this message, is being political in a way which is much more powerful than a simple political statement. So I will try to do exactly this in my little talk. I will try to communicate to you without um, being overtly um, political and sort of talk about my life, personal story as well in my relationship. And then I will also uh, talk about my work in activism, um, the project that I'm involved in with the Balfour Project, and uh, what Britain, what I think Britain should do for Palestine now, and how I envision the map of Palestine in the future, and what I hope for um, in Palestine. So, um, when, since we've um, since we've sort of touched on um, thinking about what stories maps can tell, you know, for Palestinians, I wear a, pal a map of Palestine around my neck every day, um, and it's not just a representation of a geographical space; it's a representation of my homeland somewhere where my grandparents were forced out of in 1948. It's a place um, that I try to remember every day of my life, even though I may be physically distant. Um, and you might not necessarily think about it in the geographical sense of the word. It's, it's a symbol of your homeland. And, it was, and maps are also symbols in the wider sense of the word. So I was staggered once I stumbled upon a map from medieval times, actually. And I, I thought, why is the perspective so strange? Why is um, Europe so far in the north and all the orientation is so sort of circular? And the reason was because Jerusalem was the center of the world at the time from the perspective of the um, people who designed that map. Um, so I thought, well, actually, when you think about it, um, as much as Palestine today is omitted from maps and as much it is sort of hidden away um, at other points in history, it was very convenient for European um, cartographers to actually focus specifically on Palestine for particular reasons, as were, for example, the Crusades. So um, I remember um, when I was in high school and um, I grew up in Prague in Czech Republic. Um, and I remember 
learning geography and studying geography and sort of looking at maps and I could never find Palestine on the map so what I used to do I used to add Palestine uh, like used to cross out Israel and I used to write this is Palestine um, and it was uh, I was told off for it obviously by the teachers you know because I was like ruining the textbooks for everyone else but for me that was correcting the narrative that was for me putting Palestine on the map if you like um, and it was my form of resistance it was my form of remembering uh, the Nakba and um, I actually found out that um, there's an amazing project that is happening right now um, and I would like to share it with you um, which is called um, one second just share my screen all right you guys can see this I'm sure that you have heard about this as well um, it's called Palestine Open Maps um, and what they do is that they've taken, basically it's based on the platform of open maps where people can add their content. And um, this is a map which was drawn by the British in the 40s and the 50s. Um, and I remember when I, when I first saw this, so my family comes from the city of Tira, um, at Tire, we would pronounce it to the, uh, you know, in, in Arabic, at Tire. Um, so here you can see what it looked like in the map at the time. So this is actually a map from the early 40s, um, the way it's drawn and these areas indicate basically um, this, this is the city itself in the middle and then around it are suppose, supposed to be olive groves. And now if, if I, so I'm just gonna let me just zoom out a little bit. So I remember it was really emotional for me to, um, to find this. Um, and to look for my the city from where my grandparents come from. Um, and just, I wanted to show you how, how it compares to um, Google Maps today. How, if I zoom in on the area, how completely different it is um, in that relation, in the relation to the very old map. Um, and it's obviously connected to um, the people who are making the map, but also the time. But um, what you will what you will not find um, here is the history that this city has gone through. This was actually the last city uh, that was taken by um, Zionist forces in 1948, um, and that that's the city where my family comes from. So, so these are sort of the stories that maps can tell. Um, and, even, and even on the global perspective, you will find um, the formation, you will find um, difference in importance, um, and you will find the reflection of, of the power dynamics in those maps that you will consume on a daily basis without really thinking about it. Um, so I think that criticizing this and looking at it from a decolonial perspective, understanding the power dynamics, understanding the role of agency and the, the, um, the role of maps in operation of colonialism itself, um, not only in the context of Palestine, but in the context of other um, colonies and, and settler colonial projects is incredibly useful. And, and it, it, it will sort of move away from this traditional narrative of um, the conflict of Palestine versus Israel, because suddenly you will start to understand that there was a wider role of colonialism and British interests and wider European interests in the region. Um, and I also wanted to mention that um, one of the important things that I would also urge people to notice are the names of the places um, that you will see in maps. So um, part of the colonization of Palestine was also the colonization of the linguistic landscape, um, which is something that we call Hebraization. So cities like you saw Atire, which we would pronounce as Atire, um, are now called Tira, um, or sometimes Tire. Um, a Lid is now Lido or Lida. Um, so all of these uh, changes that occurred and, and, you know, we were talking about Jaffa, which, you know, Professor Yar pronounces Jaffa. Um, so all of these differences in, in the names are also something that 
you might not necessarily notice, but there's a history to them and are connected to the continuation of um, the colonial project in Palestine and are also connected to making at home of the population that came from Europe um, in, in this landscape, which originally was indigenous to the Palestinian people, or at least at the time of 1948. And it was also seen, it's important to mention that it was also seen as the continuation of, of the conquest of, of Palestine. Ben-Gurion himself, when um, they occupied the Netab, now called the Negev, um, declared that the operation would not be complete until um, all of the names of the locations in the area, excuse me, would be converted to Hebrew, that he would not tolerate any Arab smelling names um, in the 1950s. So this is sort of, these are my thoughts about the project. Um, and um, I honestly think that um, this, this sort of platform is giving an amazing opportunity to people to think about these spaces, to think about maps um, more critically, and to also give a platform to Palestinians and to elevate their voices. Now, elevating Palestinian voices is something that I try to do um, outside of my studies. Um, and uh, I'm involved with, apart from the Balfour Project, I'm involved with um, a network of activists called Apartheid of Campus. Um, we are a student-led grassroots movement in the, based in the UK. We are um, basically national. We, we have members at most major universities. And um, our number one priority is ending complicity of our universities with um, Israeli uh, war crimes and, and um, crimes against humanity and, and breaches of international law. Um, if I don't know if there are any students in the, in the room today, but if there are any, um, look us up at Apartheid of Campus. Uh, and if you want to get involved, we definitely do. We also have media production. We have a podcast running called Apartheid of Podcast. So even people who are not students, you can check us out. Uh, on Spotify and uh, other places. So I just want to plug that if that's okay. Um, so I also want to talk about um, our um, project that we are doing with my colleague Jordan Jones and uh, Stav Salpeter. And um, this is a project called Bedouin and Herding Communities in Area C, Contemporary Realities, Indigenity and British Historical Responsibility. In this project, we are mapping out um, no pun intended, the, <laughs> the um, historical complicity of and, and legal responsibility of, um, British, of the British Empire or Britain in um, historic Palestine relating to the Bedouin communities that are in Area C today. Uh, we are also trying to look at um, what are the conditions of um, the Bedouin communities in Area C today as um, majorly as a majorly persecuted and uh, oppressed group. Um, we're also looking at it through the lens of indigeneity as particular, particular, um, particular, <laughs> sorry, uh, particular indigenous people to the land who were displaced not only in 1948, but continue to be displaced until today. And we also include a set of proposals for, um, for <laughs> A set of proposals for the British government that we hope to um, push to them and the uh, report should be published in the near future so look out for for that on the Balfour uh, project page and yeah um, we hope that people will find it enlightening uh, and the British mandate also had um, a very um, seminal role to play obviously in, in that uh, displacement of the bedding communities uh, and mapping did so as well, more specifically surveying the um, ownership of the land of, um, of Bedouins uh, in the area at the time. Which relates to, brings me to uh, what I think that Britain should do for Palestine now. I think that looking at this with the frame of decolonial understanding of issues today, we have to recognize uh, historic responsibility and um, or the UK has to recognize the issue of its historic responsibility for the situation in Palestine today. Uh, it has to end complicity and unconditional support uh, for Israel. 
which is something that we are seeing today, especially with um, the statement of the government on um, the arms embargo and the statement of the government on, or the behavior of um, the prime minister relating to the International Criminal Court ruling or investigation. Um, so I think that everyone can agree that the UK, um, not only from the perspective of its historic responsibility, but also from the perspective of its contemporary um, role in international community, has to play a more just role um, and has an, a responsibility to do so. Uh, but it will not come um, without the support of the public. So I would encourage everyone here um, who is based in the UK um, to continue the work that they're doing. And if they're not doing the work, then to get involved with uh, projects such as the Balfour Project, or if you're a student with a part of campus or the Balfour Project as well. Um, and lastly, um, not least importantly, I would like to just to very briefly say how I envision the future for Palestine, how I see the future map of Palestine. So for me, and just, I would say for every Palestinian living in the Shatat, um, in the diaspora, um, the map of Palestine will forever be a symbol of your homeland, of your home, of somewhere where you, your family comes from, of the Nakba of remembrance and of um, resistance to um, colonialism and to displacement and to erasure. Um, However, um, I personally um, see the solution or not the solution, but the future that I would like to see um, for Palestine, for the map of Palestine, um, the same solution that one of my favorite bands in um, uh, one of my favorite Palestinian bands has declared in one of their songs called Asham and the band is called Tut Art. If you haven't heard about them, go listen to them. They're really amazing. They're called Tut Art. Um, so they say in one of their, one of their songs, which means there's only one solution and that is to live in the Bilad Sham or what you would call the Levant. Um, Sham. Uh, Sham means Damascus if you don't know in Arabic. Um, so living in the land of, of the Levant without any borders. Um, so this is sort of my utopia, if you like, my ideal solution, my vision. Um, and it's connected to changing the cosmology that we live in today and challenging the coloniality, coloniality of our reality at all levels, looking for the ecumenical, um, a pluralistic worldview instead of a false Eurocentric colonial universalism and hegemony. In other words, to reimagine and recall Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Adam. That was absolutely fascinating. I always love hearing you speak and always have in all the meetings we've ever been in. So I, uh, I really appreciate also you bringing um, some of your own history and some of your own experiences and thoughts into that as well. So thank you so much. Um, okay, wonderful. Well, now we've heard from our three, uh, well, four speakers. Um, I'd now like to invite anyone who has any questions for any of them at all, um, either to write those questions in the chat or put an asterisk in the chat and or just unmute yourself um, at this point. I will remove, uh, remove the spotlight off my face so that we can all be in a meeting together. Um, just briefly, while you guys are thinking of questions, um, I just wanted to point out that we have another artist who contributed to our exhibition with us today. Um, she's not speaking. Her name is Myrna. So if anyone wants to address any questions or if Myrna, you have any thoughts that you want to um, add, then please feel free to do so. Um, I've had a couple of requests from audience members um, for email addresses for our speakers um, so they could contact you about things that you've talked about throughout this event. So if you're happy to be contacted, then if you guys could put your email addresses in the chat um, so that people can just get in touch with you. And if you're not happy, then obviously don't do that. Um, and just to let you know that uh, recording of this will be publicly available for anyone if you want to revisit it or send it around. Um, so that's sort of my end of the event housekeeping, I guess. Um, so does anyone have any questions at all? I can't see any hands up. So if you guys want to ask, oh, we've got a hand up from, um, 
I can't actually tell who's the hand up, but whoever, oh, there we go. <laughs> Please take it away. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Hello, good evening, everyone. I think that was an absolutely fantastic start. <clears throat> so interesting. I'm going to say, <laughs> only because nobody else was coming in and sometimes it's great for somebody to start so I'm going to just do that. I, my background is that I was the very first Irish representative to the Palestinians, to the Palestinian Authority. It goes back a while, it goes back to 2000, 2003, it was three years there at a time when it looked like there might be a peace process uh, about to conclude um it didn't happen it didn't happen in my time and the whole thing fell apart and there's been very little realistically that has happened since that would make encourage any sort of confidence there could be anything realistically looking like a palestinian state uh, the experience of living um living in jerusalem and uh, having an office in ramallah was one of the most transformative experiences of my life because um, we hear a lot about the Israel-Palestinian conflict, but it's very, what you have to do is you actually have to see this, what, it ha what happens, what is happening. And um, I have spent my time in retirement, which was just a few years ago, and I speak a lot about this issue. And one of the central points about what is happening in, in, in this whole conflict, and has been happening for many, many years, is the issue of the maps. What's going on in the ground? So it tells this incredible story. I think the more and more that, that maps are coming into the picture, when I talk, um, I talk about things, but when I put up the, these maps of the dis, what they call disappearing Palestine, um, it says that it, it, everyone says, we have no idea, but you can see it when you end up seeing Palestine being this little dots, little, little, little fragments with nothing there that could possibly constitute a state. You realize what's been going on. That's one dimension. One of the things I would say about this meeting is I said, I'm sure the organizers had a reason for actually having the talk ahead of the art because the maps. It would have been I would love to have been able to see the maps ahead of being able to hear the dialogue but that's me. Um, so I look forward to seeing the maps that are out there. They're crucial, but okay, that that's, tells you so much, but then there's the, the human story behind it. And the human story, when, whenever I start just telling it, I, as far as I'm doing, what I'm doing is just telling the truth about things. It starts for Palestinians, from it's from the cradle to the grave. There is this absolute, horror story, there's the intimidation, the harassment, the house demolitions, the checkpoints. It is everything on everything. I, I just honestly feel we would all be radicals if we had to live in a situation like this. So the maps, I think so, many of your speakers have already said the maps tell one story. It's vital, those, vi those maps are vital. But then there is the human story that goes in behind them. And it is a most it's a horror story <laughs> um, and I think I'll leave it at that and I really look forward to seeing the maps that are coming up I use them all the time myself in anything I do and I had the pleasure and honor of meeting Sir Vincent Fien at one at an informal um, dinner here in Dublin and he was an inspiration and I think that the Bulver um, project is doing incredible work I've enjoyed so many things on the last the big webinar that they did not long ago that's so important. So thank you, all of the organizers and all of the speakers. Um, thank you so much for that. That was very insightful. Um, uh, Felicity? Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks, um, speakers, for some really, really fascinating and um, compelling points of view around what maps are, what they can represent how they represent things um, and I, I work at the Palestine Exploration Fund in London which is uh, responsible for that survey of Western Palestine which yeah you were talking about um, 
And everything that you all said was really, you know, actually spoke very truly to me as somebody I've worked with these materials for, you know, 20 plus years. And a map is so much more than just a kind of, cup, you know, lines on a piece of paper. So much depends on who's doing the recording, what their motivations are, and they can be multiple and layered, and very, very, um, uh, you know, very, very uh, profound. And that can therefore have huge influence on the way that other people will relate to what they see on that page and how that then gets passed on to the next people who go in next and represent it in their way and so on. It's like a linear evolution. Um, uh, so thank you anyway, all of you for, for something that really gave me food, food for thought, and maybe think again about some of the things which we have in our collections. Perfect, thank you so much Felicity. Um, oh, is that a, does anyone else have any questions or thoughts about anything? Um, I can't see any hands raised, but if anyone has any final thoughts. Oh, uh, Alison. Yes, I um, put mine in the chat. Uh, just uh, the vision of a borderless Levant. Would that have any connection with the idea of a secular democratic one state in the area the one state solution and that sort of one bit of land and the palestinians have their capital in east jerusalem and call it palestine and the zionist lot call it israel um Alison, is that question addressed to anyone in particular or does uh, anyone know anyone who'd like to answer it but um, it was the last speaker who mentioned the levant borderless levant um adam, <laughs> adam do you want to uh, start yeah sure um i mean very quickly before um we move on i mean thank you very much for that Alison. um i appreciate it i mean I think the, what I sort of meant with my talk was not to point towards any particular solution uh, or with the conclusion of my talk. What I meant was more a vision for um, reimagining how we think about um, the future, how we think about space and how we think about organizing society. Um, this is not something particular. This is not something that I think I could draw or you know, write down in a, in a concise policy proposal. It's more um, like um, trying to move away from something that I called the um, Eurocentric universalism. So when you say things like secular and one state, um, we have to think about to what extent has this been useful in other parts of the, other parts of the world and what narratives this sort of leaves out in, um, in, in, the, in the region, in Palestine and, and in Israel, and obviously the, the wider region, and I'm talking about the Middle East, right? Something that we would call the Middle East, something I would call West, I would call West Asia, um, you know? So, so I think it's, it's a really important question, it's something that um, needs to be debated, but I think this can only be addressed <laughs> once um, we turn our attention to the very real and uh, material problems on the ground right now, um, today that are happening um, that Noor um, elaborated on very eloquently. So, um, so, so that was just sort of my vision for the future, but you know, we're really far away from something like that, but, but only with a particular vision, I think we can sort of have informed actions today. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Does anyone else from Noor or Imad or Yeh like to comment on that? Uh, perfect. Okay, John. Oh, sorry. I think you're muted. I think I went to unmute you and you muted at the same time. I am, I am mute. Anyway, um, Rosie, thank you very much. And thank you so much to all the speakers for what's so far been an absolutely fascinating evening. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something the last uh, questioner mentioned. Was there ever an idea for a secular state in the whole region? Um, I was very interested when Adam 
uh, mentioned a sham, meaning Damascus, and the expression Bilad is sham, meaning the lands of Damascus, quite literally, but meaning what we in the West tend to call the Levant. And I'm afraid today it is only of historical interest, but it is a very, very important thing that very few people know about, which was there was a serious attempt, an attempt that could have worked to set up a secular democratic constitutional monarchy in Bilad is Sham, what one might call Syria, what they used to call then Syria within its natural boundaries. Um, and it was frustrated by Britain and France. Um, basically the aftermath of the Sykes-Picot agreement, which Britain and France tinkered with, and of course the Balfour Declaration. There's a very good book on it, by the way, if you want to know more, that, and it's called How the West Stole Democracy from the Arabs. And it's by Professor Elizabeth Thompson. I don't know if any of you have come across it in your own researches, but I thoroughly recommend it. It's, and it's also a relatively easy read by the standards of academic works. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, um, for that very interesting comment. Um, now, if there are there any more questions or comments from anyone, um, I think maybe at this point it might be useful for me to give a overview uh, just of how the exhibition actually works. Um, so as while we're on the Zoom call, I can screen share and show you all, but also uh, Matan suggested that I do a, a recording of this as a video as well so that people can refer back to it in terms of how it actually works. Um, and then we can return back to questions after that if anyone has any more comments. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Um, well, actually, I'll put a link in the chat, which is the link to the exhibition. Um, the exhibition will be up now indefinitely until we choose to take it down, and I don't see any reason why we would. So um, that link is there, so you can revisit um, the exhibition at any point, um, and I will show you how to navigate it. So if you click on the exhibition link, it will take you to um, something that looks like this, and you'll notice it is... Uh, an interactive exhibition so you can walk around the outside um, and there's a garden with some more um, information when you go into and outside the exhibition on the other end. So all that happens is um, you can see here there's a green dot with two feet in it. Um, you just click on that dot and um, put, take it wherever you want to go and you can turn around by moving around the exhibition like this. Um, and that's essentially all that you need to do. So if you want to look at the artwork, I suggest that you start by turning around to here, which is where we have an introduction to our exhibition and a sort of guide as to what the artwork is and the chronology of why we've arranged it in the way we have. If you click on it, um, it will sort of open it for you so that you can read that. Um, you can also screenshot it and save it if you need to zoom in. Um, and then to move on to the other artworks, it works in exactly the same way. So you move around and you just click on the artwork when you need to, and you can press the X here to get rid of the artwork. So um, if you don't want to go one by one, you want to move around more freely, um, you can click on artwork that's sort of further up the room and that will take you there. So for example, if you want to get to this piece here, um, just click on that piece, it'll take you all the way down and you can look at the artwork and then if you click on the artwork um, on the side screen here, it will pop up with a description of the artwork. Uh, in the first room, we have our descriptions in English and Arabic because that was supplied by the artist. Um, in the second room, we have descriptions just in English. Um, we have at the bottom of each description who the artwork was supplied by. Uh, this was given to us by Documenting Palestine Project, which is an Instagram project that works on collecting artwork from um, Palestine sort of throughout the ages. And then in the next room, we have work from Noor, who you heard from today, and Myrna, who's also here, um, and a couple of other artists who weren't able to attend the launch, um, but contributed artwork. So that's how um, the exhibition works. The only other thing is, um, you do have to keep turning around as the only slightly um, not technically easy thing to do, but other than that, is if you go out through the exhibition, through the next room, and you can see there's a garden area, you'll be able to get out into the garden. And each of these is a biography of each of the artists that 
has um, submitted art or contributed to the art to the exhibition, and that should have their contact details on when they chose to supply them. Um, if you would like to purchase any of the artwork, then please get in contact with us and we can forward you on to the relevant artist if their artwork is up for sale um, or if the artwork, if the artist has applied their email address in the biographies, you can um, contact them directly. Um, and that is everything about the exhibition. If I just stop share now, um, does anyone have any questions? I haven't been able to see the chat as we go through. Um, about the exhibition itself. Uh, I can see Jenny's asked, are you sending the link to the exhibition by email? Yes, I will. I'll send a conclusion email um, after this with the link and um, I can also include the instructions as well. Um, and I think that was it for, does anyone else have any questions at all? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, was that someone? Yeah, can I say something? Is that Lena? Yes. Yes, please, yeah, go yeah. for it. Thank you, thank you so much for the rich and stimulating and eye-opener for future discussions. Um, I very much liked the ending note of Adam going back to the Levant. <laughs> Wish it were so easy, really, but there's there's something there. So what I think we, what we need today is really, we need to have a new narrative. Two state, one state, religious, secular, all that, blah, blah, blah. I think we need to have a new narrative and we need to see uh, where do we start? On what do we base our narrative? And, I don't want to go back as far as what Adam said to the, you know, early beautiful Levant, but maybe it could start just when the mad mandate was pronounced. And what was the situation and how it evolved and how can we uh, repair and uh, come up with uh, and a new vision that would require sacrifices from all, but a new vision that could hopefully bring some peace, justice, and tranquility to all the people in the area. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that comment. Um, if any one of the speakers wants to respond to that also, then please feel free. Any other questions or responses or comments from anyone? Um, if I can just say again, thank you to you guys um, for this opportunity and thank you for everyone who contributed today. Um, I think this, hopefully this will not be the last virtual exhibition because this will bring people together from all around the world um, and make it really accessible for everyone, regardless of um, their position. So well done, Rosie, well done, Sissy, and uh, thank you to the Butterfield Project for supporting the fellowship. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you to Adam, Noor, Yeah, and Iman, Imad for all of your um, really interesting speeches at the beginning and throughout this presentation. And thank you everyone for attending and all of your interesting comments as well. Um, and I hope you enjoy the exhibition and please, if you have any questions or any issues accessing any of the artwork, then do just get in touch with the email address that can be found on the event link that you will purchase your tickets from. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.